Welcome. My name is Rebecca Trout from the National Civic League. The League is celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. As part of the celebrations, we are interviewing some of the descendants of our founders. Today, we are joined by Kermit Roosevelt, professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania and great-great-grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. Kermit will be interviewed by Mike McGrath, Director of Research and Publications and Editor of the National Civic Review here at the National Civic League. Mike, take it away. So thanks for joining us for this interview. Um, if you, uh, the National Civic League began as the National Municipal League back in 1894, and one of the keynote speakers at the founding convention was your great-great-grandfather, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, during the speech, he, he made a point in, about the need for people to be actors rather than just critics. Now, as you know, at that time, uh, there were a lot of problems with cities and a lot of problems with American society, and so there was certainly a lot of motivation to be a critic at that time, but he focused on the need to be an activist, which is something that we've always used in our own work because these days our main sort of project as a nonprofit is not so much structural reform as it was in your great grandfather, great great grandfather's day, but civic engagement and how you engage the public with uh, local government. Do you, do you think that uh, those ideas still have importance and relevance today? Oh, absolutely. I think our society now is, is facing some of the same challenges, um, but actually some of the differences that we have, in particular the technological differences, make it a lot easier, I think, to be a sort of disengaged critic just yelling at people on the Internet rather than actually meeting with people face-to-face -face and trying to do the productive work of bringing America together. And, and so around the time that uh, Theodore Roosevelt was – uh, attending the convention that I guess I think it was really the next year he became police commissioner of New York City so at some point in his career he was very focused on local government reform uh, as an issue and, and how cities function um, what do you see as his legacy when it comes to local government reform I think that he was really interested in face-to-face -face contact um, and eliminating corruption and really having the government be a part of the community. So, you know, famously, when he was police commissioner, he would walk around New York late at night to see how the police were doing their job and to see what was going on. Um, and he was very committed to having local government really embedded in and involved in and attached to the community. What do you think that his legacy can tell leaders today about uh, how to think about political change and innovation? Well, really, I think what, what Theodore Roosevelt was trying to do was to get a government that worked for everyone, to get a government where everyone felt included, and to reaffirm the idea that the government is sort of the steward of America's resources, which should be available to everyone. So there should be equal opportunity, there should be equal access to public lands and national parks. That was a big part of his constitutional and, and ideological vision, I think. You're, uh, you're a law professor at Penn now, University of Pennsylvania, is that correct? Yes, I am. And you're also a novelist. Um, yeah. And you, you wrote a novel about uh, the decision to intern Japanese Americans during World War II. That decision was made by Franklin D. Roosevelt. What made you want to take on this uh, subject uh, as, an, as a subject of fiction? Well, I started thinking about that subject actually um, a long time ago. And, and what I was trying to explore was the way that Americans react to feeling threatened to feeling unsafe. So I was thinking really about the post 9-11 world then and the way in which our fear had led us to do some counterproductive and unnecessary things. I thought and the detention of Japanese Americans looked like a very strong parallel to that. Um, it turned out actually that this concern about dangerous people who are not like us um, isn't necessarily just part of the immediate aftermath of an attack like Pearl Harbor or September 11th. It can also become part of the national conversation going forward. 
And so I think that it's still relevant um, in some ways to what's going on now. Uh, tell me how you think it's relevant to what's going on now. Well, basically what I, what I concluded as I looked into the World War II episode and as I thought about what was going on in America um, was that when Americans feel unsafe, we start looking for people who are different from us. And, you know, the basic American idea is supposed to be if you're born here, you're a citizen, you're a full American, and you belong. But when we get scared, we start to think that other people who don't look like us or speak the same language or worship the same God maybe aren't real Americans and aren't trustworthy. Um, and then we start thinking that we need to do things to those people to keep us safe because they, they pose some kind of a threat. And you see that in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. You see that in the aftermath of September 11th. Um, but you see it also now in, in debates over immigration, for instance. Um, where there's a real tendency to take people who are different from us in some way and say that they are the other and they are dangerous and they pose a threat to America, um, you know, and we need to use these draconian measures to restrain that threat. Um, when in fact, these people might merely be different. They might not be dangerous. We might be overestimating the threat. So um, do, you, do you have a sense of how we can have sort of a more productive dialogue about immigration. I mean, obviously immigration is uh, both a challenge and an opportunity for, for communities because immigrants bring some real benefits to our economy, to the local, to local economies also by opening up businesses and so forth. But they also put some kind of strain on resources at times and there, or at least that's the perception. How do you think we can have, and, and at the, national level of politics and government, there seems to be a sort of completely polarized discussion, a completely polarized debate about what to do. Um, how do you think we can have a more productive and deliberative dialogue about this issue? Well, it's, it's hard to say because, you know, I think that the way that the immigration issue is working out is in some ways just a symptom of our larger political climate, which is extremely polarized. And what we need to do on that issue and others, I think, is to try to build bridges, um, build bridges politically rather than building walls, you could say. Um, because there should be sensible bipartisan measures that people of good faith on both sides of the issue can agree would be desirable. There should be things that we can do that everyone would agree will make this situation better. Um, but taking extreme positions on both sides and caricaturing the other side and demonizing political opponents actually isn't moving the ball forward. Yeah. Um, so changing the subject a little bit, you've also written nonfiction books. Uh, you wrote one about uh, judicial activism and you being a law professor. In the past, it seems like conservatives accuse liberal judges of being activists you know, after Brown v. Board of Education other, and, and Roe v. Wade and other sort of affirmative decisions, now it appears that the, the ball is sort of in the other court. There have been a number of fairly recent rulings by conservative jurists who liberals accuse of being activists. Where do you think, how do you think you can find a balance between judicial opinion and legislative intent? Well, I think the important thing there is to understand that everyone in government has an obligation to follow the Constitution. So it's not just the courts that should be thinking about the Constitution. The president should think about it. Congress should think about it. State government should think about it. Uh, and then the question is really going to be, when do courts think that they can trust the judgment of these other political actors to understand what the Constitution means and to follow the requirements of the Constitution? And when do they think they don't trust those other political actors? Uh, and that gives you some idea of when the court should be sort of hands off, which sometimes it is. You know, sometimes it says, unless it seems like you're doing something outrageous, we're going to let you do what you want in this area. And when the court should be suspicious, um, which again, sometimes it is. Sometimes it says, you, the government, you're going to have to make a very strong showing if we're going to let you do this. And the, the most important thing I think is to have some sort of theory uh, 
about when you can generally leave a constitutional issue to the ordinary political process because the president or the Congress is going to get it right, and when you have to have the courts step in to supervise the behavior of this other government actor. So is it your sense then that there has to be a really clear constitutional principle involved for the courts to step in, one, one that isn't sort of just, you know, where they're reaching for, for a constitutional principle, but one that's really obvious? Well, not necessarily. I mean, so sometimes you have a clear constitutional principle like the age requirement for the president, and if that's been violated, it's clear what the courts should do. Sometimes you've got something more like a general standard. So the Supreme Court has often said that the Equal Protection Clause requires the government not to treat people differently in an arbitrary or oppressive way. And then the question is, well, you know, when are you treating people differently in an arbitrary or oppressive way, and when are you treating them differently? Because that's what they deserve. That's what the right thing to do is. Um, and their courts have come up with a lot of ways of thinking about when you can trust the government to make the right call on what's arbitrary or oppressive, and when you can't. And a lot of our cases about mistreatment of racial minorities come out of that analysis where the court says, you know, here's a politically unpopular racial minority. We don't trust you to weigh their interests appropriately, and that's why we're going to be extra demanding. Now, you can't make the same kind of argument if the government is benefiting this racial minority group. So if we're talking about affirmative action rather than segregation. Um, and that's why I think in some cases the court has done things that are harder to justify with its aggressive supervision of race-based affirmative action, for instance. Uh, uh, aggressive supervision of race-based affirmative action. Could you explain what you mean by that? So I, I said before, sometimes the court will say, hey, do more or less what you want unless it's really outrageous. And for instance, if the government treats people differently on the basis of age, that's what the court will say, basically because they trust the government to do the right thing there. Um, with race, they say something very different. They say if the government wants to treat people differently because of their race, we're going to demand an extraordinary justification, and we're not going to let you do this unless you can show us it's the only way to do some really important thing. Um, and the analysis that I was just giving you about when you can trust the government to engage in justified discrimination versus arbitrary and oppressive discrimination, if you think about it that way, affirmative action and segregation look different because you can tell a pretty plausible story about why a government isn't going to give adequate weight to the interests of this racial minority that's been subjected to a history of discrimination, blacks in the United States. But you can't tell the same kind of story about why you can't trust the government if it's giving benefits to that racial group. So what this suggests is we should maybe not think about affirmative action and segregation in the same way, although the current Supreme Court does do that. Um, is, do you have an opinion on uh, whether the court should weigh in on issues like gerrymandering, where it's a sort of an abstract democratic principle, but there's no particular, uh, no, no particular sort of guidance in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights to, to suggest that that's something they should be considering? I'm generally pretty supportive of courts trying to protect the integrity of the political process. Um, and the partisan gerrymander is something that does seem offensive to our basic notions of democracy. So I would be happy to see the court try to do something about partisan gerrymandering. I mean, the, the problem that the idea that courts should protect the political process can get you into is that sometimes um, it's actually the legislature that's trying to improve the political process, say, with campaign finance reform. Um, and then the courts come in and say, no, we have a different idea of what a good political process looks like. But with the partisan gerrymander, I think it's pretty clear that it's, it's corrosive of our basic democratic values. But you use the term democratic values. Is that, how, is, is that a principle in, that's actually embedded in the Constitution, given the fact that the framers said things about democracy that were skeptical? Well, they're certainly skeptical about direct democracy. Um, it's less clear to me that they're skeptical about the idea that people's votes should have equal weight. 
that people's votes should be counted equally, that you shouldn't be able to rig the political system so that a minority is, is in control. Um, it's true, I mean, if you get technical about it, a lot of the Supreme Court's one person, one vote jurisprudence doesn't have a very strong basis in the text of the Constitution. And there were practices in the early days of the American Republic that go against that. Um, but I do believe in sort of political equality. I believe that people should have an equal political clout in terms of how their votes affect the outcome of elections. So I do think there's a role for courts in trying to prevent the legislature, particularly when it's trying to entrench itself so that it can't be removed by a popular majority to, uh, I think there's a role for courts in supervising that process. Have the courts become too politicized and partisan in recent years, do you think? And if so, how do we restore sort of faith in government and faith in the judiciary? There's a lot of public skepticism about public institutions and how they're not really taking care of ordinary Americans. What, what do you think the answer to that is? Well, I, I think that's a hard question. And, you know, to some extent, the politicization of the judiciary is just a reflection of our hyperpartisan broader society. Uh, one thing that I do think would be very beneficial would be term limits for Supreme Court justices. I think right now the composition of the Supreme Court ends up being sort of random based on who retires or dies during a president's term. You know, do you get one vacancy? Do you get no vacancies? Do you get three vacancies? Um, and then also subject to very hardball political action, um, such as when the Senate simply refused to consider a replacement for Justice Scalia. Um, if we had Supreme Court justices with staggered 18-year terms, we could have a situation where each president predictably got to appoint two justices for each four-year presidential term. And that would restore some balance to the system, and it would make each appointment lower stakes because you wouldn't be putting someone on the court maybe for 30 or 40 years. Given the current level of polarization and conflict in, in the sort of our political culture, beyond the courts, how do you think we can move forward on critical challenges facing our communities? I think one of the most important things to do is to try to increase the amount of in-person face-to-face contact that citizens have with each other and that citizens have with government. Um, one of the things that you see consistently is that the sort of anonymous online interaction that people have is much more polarized and extreme and hostile and nasty than in-person contact. Uh, and this is why I think local government is actually so important because local government is where you have a real meaningful opportunity for face-to-face -face contact between the government and the constituents and the constituents themselves. There was a time when people thought of the internet and technology as, as a real potential boon for democracy, the sort of Arab Spring and the mobilization of, uh, of, of crowds and so forth and so on. But now it appears that, that it's a real double-edged sword and maybe more uh, corrosive, as you seem to be implying, to democracy than we would have imagined, say, 10 years ago. Yeah, I think on the whole, it, it hasn't been a good thing. Because on the one hand, you have this sort of siloing effect where people um, seek out opinions that reinforce their own. Uh, on the other hand, you have this sort of dehumanization effect where people interact with others and don't see them as people because it's just, you know, a username on the screen. Um, and then add to that the possibility of manipulation through bots and fake accounts and so on. Um, on the whole, I think it's done more harm than good. I've had you on the line here for a while. I want to thank you for spending this time with us. Um, do you have any final thoughts before I let you go? Um, not really. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for doing this interview. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, sure. My pleasure. Okay. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you both for your time and for your thought provoking commentary on issues the country was facing at the time of the National Civic League's founding and how those issues have not, have not changed today. Uh, for those of you listening, please keep an eye out for more interviews such as this one from the National Civic League.